Okay, I'm Dr. Greg Warren. I'm gonna spend the next few minutes with you talking about the strategic planning process and the criticality of that process in making organizations perform in a successful fashion. Uh, high performance is the whole reasoning behind doing a strategic plan. It's not to have a plan uh, that looks good. It's not to have a plan to take care of requirements for the organization's political jurisdiction or for your board of directors uh, or whatever the case might be. The whole idea of a strategic plan, an effective and operational strategic plan, is high performance on the part of the organization. However, organizations don't perform highly by themselves. Organizations perform highly one person at a time. Each member of the employee workforce and leadership have to work in unison. The only way to get them to work in unison towards one shared vision and the strategic goals of the organization is to get them on the same page. One of the methods and the most important method besides good communications on a daily basis and things is the strategic plan. And so that's why I want to talk to you about that today. Guys, we can't really study strategic plans in detail, even though I have copies of some here for you. I have a government strategic plan. I have one of the Oregon Food Bank. I have one of a children's hospital, and I have one of Google. Even though we're gonna look at different strategic plans in this class, what good will that do you if you don't understand the nomenclature, the parts and the pieces and the, and the different phases of a strategic plan. So one, we've got to understand each of the pieces to a strategic plan, and you've got to understand how we get those pieces to come together. Because strategic plans have multiple parts, and they work as a chronology. You cannot circumvent, or you can't transpose pieces back and forth. They have to be in the proper order, or the strategic planning process won't work. It will fail. So with that, the first thing I want to do for you this morning is talk about a couple of very critical pieces. So we're going to talk about strategic plans and the strategic planning process. All right. And what we're going to do is we're going to walk through two critical factors before we even start. One is the plan itself. We have to develop a well thought out plan on how we're going to reach the organization's goals and finally fulfill its mission. So we need to develop the plan itself in writing. This is not something we just talk about amongst ourselves at various meetings. We need a tangible item that we can refer to on a yearly basis, on a daily basis for the operations of the organization. The second piece to this is we have to manage that plan. Once we get the plan developed, when we're ready to implement it and we want to execute some of the strategies in there towards mission fulfillment, we have to be able to manage the plan. What I like to call is managing the process. So we develop the plan and we're doing managing the process of strategic management. So guys, number one is you're developing the strategic plan and the implementation and execution of that strategic plan is what we call strategic management. And these two go hand in hand. You cannot, you cannot have a, a successful strategic plan unless you're managing that plan on a daily basis. The plan is not a document we put on a shelf and we pull off once a month to check our status. It is something you have to eat, live, and sleep on a daily basis. Everybody from top leadership down to each member of the employee workforce. So with that, I like to tell people that this is about, it's like the old Pareto principle, this is about 20% of the process. Developing the plan and developing the plan correctly so that everybody in the organization has input. When people in an organization have input, they're on the road to becoming stakeholders. They're on the road to having that shared vision. If you put your strategic plan together just at the corporate office, at headquarters, you're going to find you're going to have a hard road to hoe getting critical mass on board to get this plan to move in a positive direction. You need to get buy-in at the grassroots level, and how you do that is you start right with the strategic planning process. So we'll get to that in just a second. So 20% of this effort is developing the plan. Many people, unfortunately, think 
That's 100% of the effort. And once we get the plan done, that the plan is going to implement itself by osmosis, or they're going to shelve it until next year, make some minor modifications to it, and then resubmit it as their strategic plan. If they do that, they're not really strategically planning, and they're sure not engaging in strategic management. Here, 20% is a strategic plan, 80% is managing the process. So it's like the old Pareto principle, the 80-20 theory. 20% is developing the plan, 80% is obviously managing the plan. Now, with that, we have to go ahead and look at the pieces, okay, as I promised you. We can't really go any further unless you understand the pieces to this puzzle. So here we go. Typically, every organization has a mission. If they don't have a mission, they wouldn't exist. So a mission is why do we exist? Why do we exist? When you have a mission, a mission has been established by some governing body. It could be Congress for a governmental entity. It could be a state legislature for a state government entity. It's, it could be a board of directors for some type of nonprofit or for-profit entity. It could be a board of trustees for some type of college or, uni or university or hospital. But some governing body has set down there's a need. There's a need for this organization, and that's why do they exist, okay? Once you've done that, that same governing body has to select a leader. And so they bring a top leader or top leadership team into the organization. And it's up to that team, along with the board, the governing body, to set a vision for the organization. A vision. This is, where do we want to be? So the mission is, why do we exist? The vision is, where do we want to be? How good do you want to do this? I always tell people that the vision is how well do you want to accomplish the mission. Once you have these two items, it's up to this top leadership team to look at its mission and establish some general goals. Some general goals. And guys, if you need to refer to any of these, okay, you can simply look here okay, on this chart that I brought, or you can also hit this PowerPoint slide. I have them on here also. Now, I also embedded some other processes in there, but I'll go over those in just a minute for you. But you can at least refer there if you want to see these again. Goals set general direction. They just set general direction. Those are some responsibilities, typically, of the organization. If you don't do these things, you won't fulfill your mission. You absolutely have to have these. So goals are general in nature. For every goal you establish, and most organizations typically don't have less than three goals, and most don't have more than seven or eight. If you have an organization, particularly one of any size, and it only has one goal, I would be a little suspect of that. If you have an organization and they have 11, 12, 13 goals, I would be suspect of that. It's too many. You probably have someone developing some of those processes that really hasn't done this before and they're not quite sure about how to do it. Most organizations have typically four, five, or six goals, general goals. Once you have your goals established, you now need to develop objectives. Objectives for each goal. Now here's where the real work comes into play. Objectives are going to actually establish performance levels for us. So they have to be smart. They have to be smart. SMART stands for specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. So guys, your goals have to be realistic. They have to be measurable. Get there, try to squeeze these in for you. They have to be attainable. They have to be realistic. And they have to be timely. Okay? That sets what we're going to do, but also how we're going to do it and how well we're going to do it. 
These objectives, when they're smart and they're written correctly, these are our performance standards. These are the things that we have to be able to measure and determine how well we're accomplishing those tasks. So that's why they have to be smart. No longer can they just be general in nature. Once you've established these objectives, it is now time to bring in grassroots input. Every employee in the organization should receive an email from their direct supervisor stating, here are the goals and objectives for our next fiscal year. Leadership is giving you the opportunity to have some input into how do we accomplish each of these objectives. And so what you're asking the entire employee workforce in, whether it's email form, formal survey form, informal meetings, focus groups, whatever you, method you use, you are now trying to establish strategies. You need to develop strategies. The strategies are how do we accomplish our objectives. So now we're to the how. How do we successfully perform each of these objectives? And this is a great opportunity for you in leadership to ask for people's input and to start that getting people on board for this shared vision, for this strong desire and commitment to see the mission through, to see the mission accomplished. If you skip this step for input from others and you just develop the strategies at corporate, you're going to be, you're going to be really hurting this entire effort. You're going to be killing the effort before it gets off the ground. When we're done with this last piece here, you'll see how it all interconnects. So the last piece, the last major piece to this are work plans. And this is where the rubber meets the road. Work plans, some people call them action plans. This is, though, the hardest part. So far, I don't think we've identified anything that is very taxing. However, when you get to this piece, this is where you really need first-line supervisors. And everyone, but particularly first-line supervisors, but everyone who writes a performance appraisal on another person. So that means anybody who's in a leadership or supervisory management position. They need to be on board with this. Because here's where we take these five pieces in writing, we give them to each person who's a supervisor in the organization. And for the next year upcoming, for the next FY, for the organization, it is now time to take these objectives and strategies and embed them in each individual members of the employee workforce's annual performance appraisal. And this is why you can't have true strategic planning and you certainly can't have true strategic management if you're an organization that doesn't use an annual performance appraisal or your annual performance appraisal is more worried about appraising last year's success or failures more so than de designing and developing and setting the upcoming year's goals and objectives and strategies for each individual employee. This is how you get the entire plan down to the employee and you get it down there unequivocally and in an understandable fashion and in writing. So right here you're going to develop your work plans and what we're going to do is we're going to embed each organizational objective into each employee's annual performance appraisal. That is an absolute must, guys, and I'll bring that back up and we'll review that in just a little bit. I know that's hard to see, but we want to make sure we get all six pieces of this in. This can be a challenging portion or a challenging process for supervisors. It's a lot of work 
to sit down with this document and try to think of the proper verbiage and the proper semantics and the proper language and to type all of that in in the goals and objectives section for each individual employee who works for you. If you have 10 or 15 people who work for you, this can be a fairly lengthy process. Hence the reason why a lot of organizations who take this seriously have gone from semi-annual performance appraisals to annual performance appraisals. The reason being is when you do semi-annuals, by the time you get a lot of this done, you get a very short break and then a lot of people complain that it's already time to start again and it wears people out. And so we want to go ahead and do this in the form of an annual performance appraisal. However, people should obviously be getting a monthly checkup daily feedback from their supervisors. In your annual performance appraisal, there should obviously never be any surprises. So in a nutshell, guys, that is the strategic planning process. You see how critical the plan is, but now we want to look at how critical the strategic management of this is. And that would be something we touch upon in just a couple of minutes when we talk about systems and systems theory and how critical leadership is to implementing the strategic plan. So a couple of last things I want to mention here to you guys are there are some other items that when you write one of these up, these are the six absolute minimal critical pieces to a strategic plan. But there are some other items in here. There are a couple of processes. So with that, I'll put the last piece up here and then I'll open it up for questions. When you're trying to develop these pieces right in here, many organizations desire to do a SWOT analysis. A SWOT analysis. And that stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And what this allows leadership to see through the input of many, many employees through, again, the use of focus groups, surveys, feedback, risk management feedback from the various risk managers in the organization. This SWOT analysis helps leadership identify where is the organization today? How is it positioned in its environment? What does competition look like? What are our true strengths and should we play upon those and develop those further? The other, the other analysis piece is a gap analysis. And the gap analysis, in a nutshell, is determining where do we want to be versus where are we. And you're looking at and measuring the gap between those two. Now, I realize it's a very shortened version, a very shortened definition of a gap analysis. But it is, here's where we're at. And we just determined that through the use of a SWOT analysis and a great deal of other input. And here's our vision. And now we have to determine what do we have to do? And that's what the gap analysis is designed for, is to tell us what do we have to do? What direction do we need to head? And so the SWOT analysis is very, very critical to helping us determine our vision, our goals and objectives. And of course, the gap analysis is just as critical, just as critical. And then finally, when you see these various types of strategic plans, there is no one cookie cutter method for presenting your strategic plan. If you pull 30 strategic plans from 30 different organizations, whether they're nonprofit, educational, military, it doesn't make any difference. The format is going to be a little different. I see some organizations in here, they'll actually put in guiding principles. What guides the organization as it operates on a day in and day out basis? I see other organizations that obviously at the very beginning of this, when they present this plan, will have the CEO's message. Basis, basically, it's the CEO explaining to their employee workforce and to all other entities that might be interested, why do we do this? What direction are we heading? How well do we want to operate as an organization? How successful do we want to be? And then, of course, there are some other pieces, like values, for instance obviously values and some organizations will call those core values it's what the organization stands on integrity respect discipline diversity all of those are core values 
So sometimes when you see these six major pieces in writing in front of you, don't be surprised if you see some other pieces embedded in there in different areas. And then there's one last piece in this, is there has to be accountability in a strategic plan. So you have to have an accountability factor in this. So you have to determine what are we going to measure. And some of that should have already been established when you developed your objectives. But now the question is how? So you develop your different metrics. They're just different types of metrics on how we're going to measure our outcomes. What is the real impact of our efforts? Are we getting closer to success? And we have to watch this progress and in order to track this progress and measure this progress we have to have some metrics built in. So that's why these objectives are really critical that they're specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. Absolutely critical. I'll close with this. It doesn't make any difference if you're General Motors building the Corvette. The Corvette and the development of the Corvette was a strategy. It wasn't by, it wasn't by chance that General Motors invested through Chevrolet, invested the amount of money it took to get Corvette off the ground. It was an idea that was born during World War II when American um, GIs and servicemen were in Europe and they, be, they fell in love with European sports cars. They came back to America and there are no sports cars. And so some automobile manufacturers decided to fill that void and, Ge and Chevrolet and General Motors decided in 1953 to build the first Chevrolet Corvette. Now guys, as you well know, a lot of automobile manufacturers have come and gone, and certainly a lot of models that they have made over the years have come and gone. And the Chevrolet Corvette is not only still here, okay, not only still here after well over half a century of production, but in 2014 they're coming out with the next style of Corvette. Or you can look at somebody like this gentleman here who you should recognize, Howard Schultz at Starbucks. And how he took an idea from when he was traveling in Italy and he saw how the Italians enjoyed sitting outside in open air cafes, enjoying a great cup of coffee and gathering and talking and visiting. And he said to himself in the early 1980s, why wouldn't that work in the United States? And so he went after his market. He went after a niche market. He purchased the company eventually, developed the firm into what it is today, and he has a very interesting strategic plan, which you can find on the internet, obviously. All you need to do is Google it. It's excellent. And we'll be watching a video on Starbucks later on, and in fact, on page six of your text, there's a nice piece on Starbucks, which we'll be going over. Or you can even go to a government entity, like this gentleman here, Admiral Thad Allen, who is, re is the retired commandant of the United States Coast Guard. And he is one of the first individuals I've ever seen, particularly in government, who came into an organization that was already working very well and made a conscious decision to change the strategic plan, the direction of the organization, and the management of the organization on how to get there. And so he developed an entirely new strategic plan and he developed a method of implementing that strategic plan called the Coast Guard Modernization Program. And in his first annual report right here you can see many 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 critical pieces to his new plan. There's also a video that came out with that right after he wrote this article called A Habit of Change. And this article came out after this one called Making Waves. You don't typically hear of those kinds of things from government leadership. Government leadership is typically designed to keep everything on a level playing field and not to have any one entity, enti, any one entity's success level go too high. However, this gentleman wasn't satisfied with high performance, he wanted to maximize the potential of the Coast Guard and for that he had to implement some major change. And that's why you see this article, Making Waves, another one called A Habit of Change, 
And then you'll see things in a video that we'll watch later called Coast Guard Modernization. I'll either be posting that on Blackboard for you or I'll show it in person in class. But you will definitely get a chance to see that. It's only 13 or 14 minutes long, but in that 13 or 14 minutes, you'll see the criticality of all of this put into action. With that, I'll open it up for any questions at this time. Thank you very much.